Today we're going to talk about chromosomes, meiosis, pedigrees, and disorders. And what you're looking at there are some actual chromosomes. So let's dive in here with a little bit of a kind of a review of where we came from with Mendel here. So remember, Mendel came up with this whole knowledge of basically of what was going on with genetics before we understood anything about genetics. He was completely unaware of chromosomes, DNA, or even Punnett squares. Like these simple things that you guys are doing in class, these Punnett squares, were not something that Mendel had. He was just using pure math to figure all this stuff out. Now all these different variations like yellow flowers versus white flowers that he was studying, he referred to those variations as factors. Um, and today we recognize them as something um, kind of a little bit uh, more, more in depth, I would say. So let's start with his principle of segregation. So this is a very important, one of the very important principles that Mendel came up with. Uh, and essentially what he did was he theorized that for each trait, um, offspring would inherit one of these factors uh, that we call, refer to as alleles from each parent. So one came from each parent. And this is the idea of the principle of segregation. The alleles separate during the production of gametes. Now gamete is just a word for sperm or eggs. And you can see on the Punnett square there, we even drew in some sperms and some eggs. Um, if you look at over there at the male parent, it says big Y, little y. And what we're saying here in the principle of segregation is that those two alleles, dad had big Y and little y, that means he'll produce sperm that either have a big Y or a little y, right? There's a 50-50 chance that the sperm's gonna have a big Y, 50-50 chance it's gonna have a little Y. Same thing for mom, if she's big Y, little Y, she's only gonna produce eggs that have either a big Y or a little Y. They don't have both. So those things separate, and then the egg's gonna give one of them, and the sperm's gonna give one of them, so that the babies inside the Punnett square there will have one of those alleles from dad and one of them from mom. And that's the whole idea behind the principle of segregation. Now. It was a big mystery still um, to Mendel and to everybody at the time as to the mechanism that separated these alleles. Like he knew that they were inheriting one of these things from the mother plant, one of them from the father plant, but he didn't really know like how that happened. Well, we had to understand DNA before that was really possible. So enter what we call meiosis, which is a process that's going to take uh, a cell and convert it into either four sperm or four egg cells. And in so doing, divide up the DNA or separate, segregate those alleles when we're all said and done. We're gonna go into this in a little bit more detail as we go. Um, so just kind of follow along here. So when we referred to Mendel's factors, um, these are now what we refer to as alleles uh, of genes. So Genes are specifically sections of DNA that contain instructions for coding for a certain protein. And remember, you're made up of proteins. So we've got a picture here of your DNA, and the DNA, of course, has A's, T's, C's, and G's. And a section of that code, right, a section of that code is what's utilized through what's called transcription and translation to make an actual protein. Now, the proteins are what carry out functions in your body and what make you up. Everything from, you know, what color your eyes are to how tall you are to what, um, what color your hair is and everything else. All these phenotypes are the proteins that are coded for in your DNA, right? There is a gene for curly hair. It creates a protein when it's read off of your DNA that is a curly shape. And then when that's incorporated into your hair, that gives you curly hair. Some proteins are created that reflect light a certain way, and that might give you black hair or blonde hair or brown hair. So all of those things are coded for in your DNA, and if a section of DNA, a segment, is a gene, we can talk about the gene that's specific for a certain color of hair. And what Mendel's trick to realize was, was that you got one gene from mom and one gene from dad for each of those characteristics. For every characteristic, you got one from each parent. Um, that's what he had sorted out. Now, when uh, DNA uh, copies itself, 
right? When it comes time for a cell to divide, the DNA molecule actually unzips and it replicates. And we've talked about this some already. Uh, remember when we talked about the process of mitosis, which was nuclear division of the cell, the DNA all has to be copied, and then eventually the DNA is, you know, comes to the middle of the cell and then pulls back apart and you end up with two new cells when you're all said and done with the cell cycle. Um, that's the replication of DNA. Now this takes place when we're going to make sperm and eggs as well, you've got to copy the DNA uh, to make these things. But it's a little bit different, so we'll kind of see how that plays out as we go. Now let's look at what a chromosome, whoop, a little too fast there, sorry. Let's look at what a chromosome actually is. So when we look at the DNA, when, it's, when we're going to do cellular division, the DNA has to coil up into these super coiled looking things. So we think about kind of in terms of levels of, I don't know, granularity here. So we can look at the level of the individual DNA molecule, which is this double helix, which is the very bottom of the picture there. Um, to package this stuff, it starts to wrap up. Okay, don't get hung up on everything else in the picture there, but it coils up and then it super coils again, and it ends up looking like sort of somewhat like this stringy, like spaghetti sort of looking stuff it's all packaged up in these X-shaped looking things that we refer to as chromosomes. So a chromosome is like basically a big bundled up bunch of DNA. Um, however, specific regions of that chromosome will always contain the same type of DNA. For instance, like that little box there might be a super coiled up region that contains a gene in it somewhere along all that DNA that codes for hair color or eye color or height or something like that, okay? So I try to keep that in mind as kind of as we're going along here, is those X-shaped things, or sometimes if we're looking at a single one, we're just, it's just a chromosome, okay? So each coiled up DNA molecule, we refer to that as a chromosome. Um, after replication, the copying of all that DNA, a chromosome is going to have two identical DNA molecules. So that's where this X-shaped thing sort of comes from and we refer to these two sides as sister chromatids. So one side is a duplicate of the other side. Right? If your cell's gonna divide, it has to make a copy of all that DNA. Remember, and those are gonna line up in the middle of the cell, and then during anaphase, they'll pull to opposite sides of the cell. Okay, and then we'll, again, we'll eventually reform a two nuclei and we'll have two cells. Okay, so those are the sister chromatids. They're identical copies of each other. Here's an actual chromosome Wow, we're going really fast here, there we go. Here's an actual chromosome uh, under a microscope, what it would actually look like under a scanning electron microscope. You can't see that with our microscopes in lab. Uh, but you see kind of where the illustration, where we get this sort of X-like shaped thing. They're held together in the middle, the two sister chromatids, by something known as a centromere, which we already studied a little bit. So remember, there are two of each chromosome. You get one from mom, in one from dad. And we refer to those two as homologous pairs. Okay, they've got the same information in a, in a sense, but different details. In other words, the one you got from mom might code for, um, I don't know, round seeds. And the one that came from dad might code for wrinkly seeds, right? If round seeds are dominant over wrinkly seeds, even though you got the wrinkly seed from dad, as a pea plant, you're gonna be round. So those, those are two copies of the same information, um, but the details are a little bit different. So that's why I refer to them as homologous pairs. Here's a whole boatload of chromosomes here. In fact, we inherit 23 of these pairs of chromosomes from our parents. Okay, so humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Other, other organisms might have more or less. They, in fact, do. Um, and the number of chromosomes you have doesn't make you like a more intelligent creature or a less intelligent creature or be able to have more features or something like that. There are some worms that have way more than 23 chromosomes. Um, there are uh, also some very intelligent creatures that have very few or more than us. It's, it's just kind of depends on the creature and the, the traits that they have and what's happened evolutionarily with their genome. So don't get hung up on how many you've got. The humans have 20, 23, okay? When we lay all these things out together and kind of set and, and sort them by length, 
we create something called a karyotype. So it's just basically this picture of all of the X and Y or X chromosomes that you have, except for that last set there, the 23rd set, notice at the very bottom, those are referred to as your sex chromosomes. So pair number 23, uh, the two long lines there at the bottom right hand of your screen, uh, the, the one on the left is an X. I know it just looks like two lines. If we spread it out a little bit, you'd see it's an X. And the one on the right there of it, it's two little or shorter segments. That's what we call a Y. So what we're looking at here in this picture is actually a boy, okay, a, a, a male human. Um, so looking up there in the top left, we've kind of got it separated out for you there. Pair number one, there's two chromosomes. They, they're, they're lined up next to each other, but sometimes they're drawn as little Xs. Um, you've got a homologous one on the left, a homologous one on the right of that. One came from mom, one came from dad, right? Um, both of those homologous chromosomes each contain the duplicated DNA strand there, okay? And this is known as a karyotype. It's basically like a way of looking at our chromosomes. We'll see why that might be important here near the end of the lecture. Just another picture here, uh, kind of what this looks like. We've got our homologous chromosomes there on the left. They have centromeres, okay? Um, we've got two pairs of sister chromatids over there on the homologous chromosomes on the right. So when they're stuck together, we would refer to the two chromatids um, as a chromosome, right? And when they're separated, we would still refer to them as chromosomes. So basically in chromosome, we're talking about a big coiled up piece of DNA um, that we could actually separate out and talk about the individual genes on. So I recognize this is a big coiled up mess of DNA, but specific regions of it code for specific things. So there's certain genes that are exactly, and we just did a little color coding here, the, the big P, the little P there, that determine our traits. They're located in a certain region of the chromosome. And in a little bit, we'll see why that's important. Um, so maybe there's a gene for whatever this P is here on the left, and there's a gene for whatever the P is there on the right. If you inherited both of those, right, you would be heterozygous, you'd be big P, little p. And that's how this really works out in terms of genetics. This is the science behind what Mendel had discovered. Here's the picture of the same thing with pea plants. So let's say that one of those chromosomes contains the wrinkled recessive gene, which is that one on the purple one there. And then the green one, which you happen to get from the other parent, contains the round, which is dominant. Well, your phenotype, what you look like, will be round because even though you contain both of those, the round one in Mendelian dominance is dominant over the wrinkled one. So you see the round version. But that parent could then pass on that recessive wrinkled gene to a later generation of kids. In the picture on the bottom there, you've got the same thing, and it's showing you two recessive. What if you inherited the wrinkled gene, that little segment of DNA from mom and the wrinkled gene from dad, that same little segment of DNA, well, you've got two copies of that gene. The, if you've got recessive, recessive, you're gonna be wrinkled and your phenotype looks wrinkled. So this is really what's going on behind all the stuff that Mendel discovered with his pea plants. Now, when cells divide, each DNA, i.e. chromosome, makes a copy of itself, okay, and then those sister chromatids are going to separate into new cells. So we've got a picture there of the chromosome. We're going to duplicate it, so we end up with this X-like looking thing that contains two duplicate copies known as the sister chromatids. Okay. Then we need to separate those and then put them into two new cells. Okay. That, so this is the process of copying that DNA. And you right, might remember this type of nuclear division that we talked about. It's called mitosis. Be careful here because mitosis is something we studied in the last unit. Meiosis with an E is something that we're studying in this unit. I know the words are really similar, but part of this is really the same. So you're going to recognize the phases here of the cell cycle. Remember interphase, and then there is the part of nuclear division known as mitosis that starts with prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then finally cytokinesis where the cell actually divides. Um, but let's just glance at these again really quick here. In particular, I want to point out 
that uh, in metaphase there, you've got the chromosomes lined up in the middle of the cell. They are, the, their sister chromatids are there. And then in anaphase, when they start to pull to the other sides of the cell, they kind of look like little A's, don't they? The, the, the sister chromatids are pulled to opposite sides. So we split them apart at the centromeres and we pulled them to opposite sides of the cell. And now we'll reform our nuclei and we'll have new cells when this whole thing divides. That was mitosis. Well, um, let's look at another little gander here of mitosis. So in mitosis, here we've got a, an organism, a hypothetical organism that's got uh, two chromosomes here. Okay, it's got, it's got one pair of chromosomes. So uh, what happens is that in DNA replication, the chromosomes are um, copied, right? So this is, this is based essentially mitosis here. And we end up with these eight X-shaped sort of things that then migrate to the middle of the cell there. And then they're going to pull back apart and the sister chromatids are going to separate. Okay. So when we're done, after mitosis, you have two identical cells. Both has an exact copy, copy a replication of the original DNA is contained in both cells. Meiosis is going to be different. What's going to happen at the end of meiosis will be different. This is mitosis. This is regular old cell division. So let's discuss what, what, what that means in terms of what we call diploid and haploid. So you'll see this word, diploid, which means, which is sometimes written as 2n, which n is the number of complete sets of chromosomes that we have, okay, as opposed to 1n. So di, diploid means 2, same thing. So what's going on is that all of the cells in your body, which we refer to as somatic cells, you might see that word on the test, they have uh, two, they have two, chrome, two sets of chromosomes for every single gene that we're talking about. Okay, remember, that happened because you got one from mom and one from dad. If we're talking about peas, maybe you got a wrinkled one from mom and you got a round one from dad. So you've got two for every single characteristic that we might possibly talk about, okay? Uh, that means that those cells are diploid. That's every, pretty much every cell in your body, except for a couple. There are, there are certain cells in your body that are known as gametes. Those are sperm or eggs. These cells are haploid, or 1N, because they only have one chromosome. So think about it. It's, it's pretty simple when you kind of break it down. If the baby, uh, when, the, when the sperm and the egg come together, is going to have to be 2N, that means the sperm and the egg both have to be 1N, because when you add 1 and 1, you get 2. Get it? So it really is that simple. All meiosis is, is the process, meiosis with an E, is the process of having that DNA up so you only have 1N. Okay? So gametes, which are sperm and egg, are one n or haploid as we as we call it okay they have one of every chromosome they don't have two sets so each haploid one has a round gene or each haploid one might have a wrinkled gene but they don't have both they don't have two round ones or a wrinkled and round one or a wrinkled and wrinkled one they've only got one that's what haploid means so let's talk about meiosis here it is the process of making these haploid gametes, like I've been saying all along. So what we're doing here is we're taking an original cell, which is diploid. That's the one on the far left there. there. We've got both the male and the female version here happening. So look at the male one. It doesn't really matter. The top one's the male one. That cell undergoes something that looks an awful lot like mitosis happening twice. In fact, sometimes we even say meiosis is like mitosis twice. Essentially, what's going to happen here is the cell's going to copy all of the DNA. It's then going to um, divide, right? Then it's going to go through the process of dividing yet again. So when we've gone through this whole thing, you're not just going to end up with two cells when you're done. Because we've divided twice, you're going to end up with four cells when we're done. And each of those four cells, which will be a sperm or an egg, are then going to have half, or they're going to be haploid, one N, 
they're going to have one chromosome for every single every single gene that we can talk about. Okay, so we've halved up the DNA in a way. Okay, just made one copy of each thing. Same thing for the egg cells. There's a little more complexity there. Don't get confused by it. If you look at the sperm cells, that's really all you've got to kind of remember there. So meiosis, like we just said, is the production of four haplo haploid gametes, whether those are sperm or eggs. It involves two nuclear divisions. Like I said, it's kind of like mitosis twice. We refer to those as meiosis one and meiosis two. And I'm not gonna get into the huge nitty gritty here on all the different steps, because you've already learned mitosis, right? Some of them are really similar. Remember IP mat, interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Right? And then finally cytokinesis. It's all the same stuff, really, except there's a few little twists along with this. Um, one thing that I want to point out, which is, which is pretty important, is notice here at what's called prophase 1. So interphase, um, the cell is growing, the DNA is being replicated. Um, prophase 1, something particular happens, and it's called crossing over. And you're probably going to need to know that. And we're going to talk more about it in depth, but what occurs is a further shuffling of the DNA. So even though we've just copied all the DNA and they're on these, on these sister chromatids, those sister chromatids can flip-flop DNA, swap DNA between each other. So they shuffle the deck, if you were, of genetics. Okay. Uh, as we kind of move along there, you're going to notice that eventually, as we go along there, we're going to end up with four haploid cells when we finish there at the end of meiosis two. Okay, so that's the real important there, important part. So, like I said, we oftentimes compare compare this with mitosis, but there are some similarities, but there's some really specific differences. I'm not going to touch on all the differences, but I'm going to pick on the biggest ones. Up top, the picture showing you there is mitosis. Down below is meiosis, which is sex cell division. Up top is body cell division. Okay, Somatic cells on top, uh, gametes on the bottom. Let's look at some of the differences here. So uh, they both are going to start with a diploid cell. Okay, good. Then you're going to notice that there's two phases. There's meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 of meiosis, whereas mitosis is just one time through. Okay. So there's two divisions there that go on in meiosis. Um, that's how you end up with four cells at the end there. So look at the end products. Up top, what you end up with are two diploid cells from mitosis, from its single nuclear division. Down below, with meiosis, you end up with four haploid gametes. Okay. Notice, look at the chromosomes in there. Up top there, there's that red one and that blue one. Each cell has the red one and the blue one. Down below, each cell has either a red one or a blue one. But there's more. Some of those red ones and some of those blue ones have flip-flop parts. Like a piece of a red one is now where a blue one was. They've, they've swapped. Well, that swapping is what I've been referring to as crossing over. So when they're really close together there, um, during, during meiosis, during prophase 1 is the phase that it happens in, those sister chromatids can swap chunks of themselves. They can flip-flop. Now, I mentioned this before, but when there's genes that happen to be very close together on one of those chromatids, like, like, like for instance, blue hair and, and oh, sorry, blue, hair, blue eyes and blonde hair, you, always, you usually see a child that has both of those characteristics because it just so happens that that eye color and that hair color happen to be really close together on the same chromosome. So when that crossing over happens and the flip-flopping occurs, the shuffling of the DNA, they always shuffle together in the deck. Usually. Don't have to, but usually. Okay, that happens during prophase one. Here's a better picture of crossing over. So crossing over is the reason it's important and the reason that I bring it up is because it astronomically increases the variation that a single human being can create for their sex cells. So think back to the whole point of sexual reproduction. The reason for sex in organisms is to mix up the DNA. 
why would you want to mix up the DNA? Well, it's not like, you know, some critter was sitting around in the ocean at one point in time was like, well, I should figure this sex thing out so I can, you know, mix up my DNA a little bit. It would be a good deal. You know, then my babies wouldn't all look the same. That's not really what's really going on, right? We all recognize that. So what's really, what we really think, one of the evolutionary reasons for sexual reproduction likely has to do with diseases, has to do with viruses and bacteria and things attacking organisms. Because if your DNA gets shuffled, if everybody's not a clone of everybody else, there is a much higher likelihood that some of the individuals that result from any mating event will have some resistance or have some better survival characteristic that will allow them to survive some new disease that we don't even know about yet. So, and we've already seen that, like take a look around it, you know, what's going on with the coronavirus. There are some individuals who have no effects from it at all, and we don't even really know why yet. We're still trying to sort that out but other people are impacted dreadfully by it. So uh, that is one of the reasons for sexual reproduction in organisms, and crossing over is a big part of that. So think about the fact that you get half your DNA from mom and half from dad, right? For every characteristic, you got one of those alleles from mom, one from dad. Well, if you're a pea plant, you got a, a yellow from mom for seed, and maybe you got a green from dad. Well, if yellow is dominant, you're gonna have yellow seeds, but you got both of those. But what if you could mix it even further? In other words, you didn't just get that one or the other one. Along with that, you could kind of shuffle them up before you made the sperm or the eggs. So now, yeah, you're still getting one from mom, one from dad, but you're gonna shuffle which ones you get. And that's what crossing over happens. It allows us to do, and it happens in prophase one, and it allows for us to have over 8 million different gamete combinations per human. So each human is capable of producing over 8 million different combinations of their DNA in their sperm or their eggs. That's a lot, right? Which is why there's so much variation in the world. It's a good thing, right? So occasionally, I want to talk just a little bit about some of, in particular, just one of the um, things that results when there's a problem with this situation is, is that there can be errors that occur during meiosis, which is the division to create sex cells. And those are known as chromosomal disorders. So there's lots and lots of different ones, but I want to mention one in particular that uh, many of you are probably familiar with. Maybe you know somebody who has this um, in your family or elsewhere. I certainly do. Um, and this is referred to as non-disjunction. So this is what happens when you produce gametes with an abnormal number of chromosomes. So uh, the chromosomes fail to separate. If you look at that picture there where it shows non-disjunction, they fail to separate properly. And so you can end up with an extra chromosome in an egg or a sperm and uh, one less in another one. Now, some of these types of events, depending on which chromosome they occur in, because there's 23, uh, uh, 23 different chromosomes, right, sets of chromosomes, depending on which one they occur in, they can be lethal, and, and oftentimes they are in animals. In plants, a lot of the times, a, a non-disjunction or, or a chromosomal abnormality actually immediately creates a speciation event, and you evolve a new plant that can no longer mate with its parent generation is kind of a unique form of evolution. But in animals, a lot of the times these things are lethal. Sometimes they're survivable, um, but oftentimes they produce some issues. And tri what's known as trisomy 21 is the cause of what we call Down syndrome. And like I said, you might know somebody who, who has this, um, and it's specific to, it's known as trisomy 21, because it's an extra chromosome in your chromosome number 21. So if you look at the karyotype there of this individual, and you look down there, um, you can see that number 21 has three of them in there. So that's where the tri, the three, comes from. Okay, and it's, a, it's basically a failure to separate of those, um, uh, um, of those chromosomes uh, during meiosis, during the creation of the sex cells. Okay, so let's turn now, last thing I wanna mention, is what a pedigree is. Let's talk a little bit about pedigrees. So all pedigrees really are, are like big family trees. 
there are ways of tracing a trait through an entire family of individuals. So let's kind of go over the uh, features here, the symbols. Boxes or squares are males, females are circles. So when we represent this, the two at the top are the parents, and then their children, their offspring, are denoted by little lines that drop underneath of them. That's all pretty self-explanatory. Then what we typically do is if the trait is expressed, we shade that box in. Okay, if it's a, it's a male or shaded in, it's a circle, it's a female. If the trait or individual is not expressed, but is carried by the individual, we sometimes show that by a half shaded in box or circle. So these things are heterozygous. In other words, they, they're a carrier. And we talked quite a bit about that in sex-linked diseases, right? Like we were saying, you know, mom could be a carrier on her X chromosome. So we might shade half of that in if we were showing that um, on one of these pedigrees, okay? Um, then if, if uh, well, you really won't see too much of the death ones or the you know, mating is pretty obvious. It's when you've got a line between two of them, okay? You can look at one of these pedigrees in terms of a phenotype like this, where you actually are showing which ones have attached earlobes versus um, unattached or lobed earlobes. So you could mate two parents that have lobed earlobes and find out that some of them have attached. Notice the four babies there, one of the babies had attached earlobes. So right away I'm noticing that attached earlobes must be a recessive trait. So you might have to sort some of this out on the test or some of the assignments, um, but it's pretty obvious that if both parents are showing that they have lobed ears and only one child got the attached ones, it probably had to be recessive, right? One characteristic of recessive traits is that they can skip a generation. And check that out. If we drop down to the third generation on this, the third line down, everybody has lobed earlobes. <laughs> it's like double lobed lobe lobed ear lobes, but the next generation, there's some that have attached. So attached is, is obviously a recessive thing there. See how it skipped a generation and it showed back up? Um, recessive traits can do that. A dominant trait can't skip a generation. If, it, if you're going to see it, it, it'll have to be in the next generation. It can't skip. We could also show genotypes, which is how the genes are with these. So showing that same thing that we just talked about here. Um, so we're looking at attached versus unattached, and it's exactly how I said it was, I think. I'll look at this here. So we've got two parents that are heterozygous. They've got a big and a little allele. They're showing the dominant, which is A, which stands for lobed. And then we drop down to the children, and one child got little a, little a, which is attached. So they got the recessive, right? But that's going to that's gonna hide in a generation. Okay, so that, that parent... Over on the left there, we've got a big A, big A, mated with the big A, little a. Well, they have some babies. And they're all going to show that recessive character, or that, sorry, that dominant characteristic, even though there's a hidden recessive one in there. If that individual mates with another that's got a recessive, that's heterozygous, some of the babies are going to come out with that little a, little a characteristic. Right? So this is a pedigree. It's a way to show how it trace genotypes and phenotypes through generations, right? For talking generations, there's one, two, three, four generations up there. Okay, that's it for today.